welcome everyone to the session on uh, compiler optimization. So these are the folks who are trying to make uh, things run faster, so you can do the same amount of uh, computation faster, or alternatively, you generate less CO2 in the atmosphere uh, for the same amount of, of work. Um, so to kick things off, we will have a talk from, by Ziv Scully uh, about a compiler optimization for automatic database result caching. Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Ziv. Uh, this is joint work with Adam Chapala, and I'm going to start with story. Uh, so when I was an undergrad at MIT, I was a member of the Educational Studies Program, or ESP. ESP is a student group that runs educational events for high schoolers and middle schoolers in the Boston area, um, in which MIT students teach them classes on whatever they like. So this is a talk about web applications. Let's talk a bit about the ESP website. So when students want to register for, uh, for our events, they see a catalog of classes, like this one on the right. Um, they can see all sorts of information about the classes, including, crucially during registration, how much space is left. So we can see here we have two classes that are full, and one class has a bit of space left. So uh, let's, let's get everybody on the same page as to how web applications work. So at a high level, uh, most web applications are organized into two separate parts, a web server and a database. So the web server handles requests, the various requests from user actions, um, such as show me the catalog or register for a class. Um, so in order to fulfill these requests, the web server typically needs some sort of persistent data that's the same between requests. This data is stored in, in the database. Uh, so the web server communicates uh, with the database in order to fulfill the request. For example, uh, in order to show the catalog, the web server will do a query basically asking the database for all of the classes, the database ID title of all classes. So uh, there are many query languages. In this talk, we're always going to be using SQL or SQL or some simplified version of. And uh, we can see queries of two parts, some subset of data that's selected and a condition under which data is selected. So there are many rows in the database. We select the ID and title of all of them in order to show the catalog. Maybe the user then wants to check if a particular class has space by clicking a button. By clicking a button, that'll send a request to the web server, um, which will result in a different sort of query. Uh, in this case, selecting some different data, the size of the, the size of the, the maximum size of the class and the current size of the class for that particular class. So the condition specifies that the database ID of the class should be this guy, which specifies a unique row. Then other actions uh, uh, don't lead to database queries so much as updates. So some, so these actions basically need to change that persistent data. So when a student registers for class, uh, the web server sends an update to the, basically specifying that for the row with ID equals 11128, perform a certain data transformation. So in this case, updating the size because a new student has registered, so the size becomes the previous size plus one. So this is a high-level over overview of how web applications work. Um, so the ESP website, uh, you know, run, runs lots of, hands lots of students every year, but we get some emails complaining about some problems with our website. Uh, they send us screenshots like this. They'll say, hi, I'm a student. I'm trying to register for the school sounding class. It looks like there's space left, uh, but then when I click register, it tells me that the class is full. And so I think maybe someone took the spot before me, so I refresh, I try again, and get the same answer, I get the same problem over and over again. And we get a lot of emails like this every year. <laughs> and so uh, they all ask, what's going on? Am I doing something wrong? It turns out there's a problem with the ESP website. So let's go back to our web application picker. There's a key piece of information I've left out of this, which is that there's more than one person on the internet. Uh, so there are lots and lots of students all trying to register at the same time, so they're all sending request the data to the web server, which results in lots and lots of queries and updates being sent to the database. Now, when this happens, it's typical that the database becomes the performance bottleneck for the website. This is the case for the ESP and many other web applications. So in order to maintain reasonable, reasonable performance, most web applications employ caching. So duplicating some data from the database right on the web server. So uh, caches associate a key, in this case class IDs, with some value, in this case the current size of that class. And by replicating some data on the web server, uh, we can alleviate some load from the database because we can handle lots of queries by going directly to the cache, which, is, which both uh, reduces the database load and is just faster. So this greatly increases web application performance, but it adds a complication 
because now certain actions like registering for a class that modify a database state also need to take into account the cache. So we need to invalidate cache entries. And the data that they've replicated becomes old. So as you can probably guess, the, ES the sort of bug the ESP website is having is a caching bug, uh, which begs the question, why is caching hard? In this case, I mean, there, there are, you can imagine very complicated systems, but in this case, we have a single web server, a single database, and, uh, you know, and we're assuming that the only thing talking to the database is the web server. And it turns out that even in this kind of very simple uh, scenario, there are still lots of pieces that need to work together in order for caching to work successfully without basically introducing bugs that change the behavior of the web application in, um, in bad ways like we saw with the ESP website. So, you want to add caching to a web application, well, first you actually need to, um, you need to instrument your program somehow with halls to a certain ca to caching function. So to, you have to decide what program regions you want to cache, what the cache keys are going to be, what cache keys are going to associate with, with that cache data. Um, and then you also, so you need to do this sort of instrumentation to add caching to a program. You also need to add invalidations. Uh, so basically, anytime your program sends a request to the database, uh, sends an update to the database, um, you need to also add a, some sort of validation. So adding these invalidations uh, typically entails analysis of the SQL queries um, involved in both the cached region and update that you're adding invalidations to. Uh, once you've got all, your, all of your caching calls and all of your invalidation calls, you need to come up with a, with a data structure that supports all of it efficiently. Um, and, we'll, and finally, this all needs to work in a concurrent setting. So we have a single web server, but it might have many, many threads to handle these many, many requests happening all at the same time. So it turns out the bug in the ESP website, which is still open today, is probably some still concurrency bug. I say probably because it's still open. So we have the four, four big problems uh, that we need, to, we need to address whenever we get caching to a website. Now, websites aren't a new thing. Caching is not a new thing. Uh, there are lots of existing approaches um, well, but most of them fall under two main categories. One is adding caching manually, um, which has the obvious downside that you have to do a lot of extra work to maintain, to maintain uh, basically, to maintain the accuracy of the program instrumentation. So in particular, whenever you change an update, you have to think about all of your different caches and how the invalidations change. Uh, this is rarely used in practice. Most of the t most web applications use some sort of library. Um, such as an object resource manager or, or, or ORM. Uh, but ORMs have the problem that they are not very flexible. So basically what these libraries do is they, instead of exposing SQL itself, they expose kind of some limited sorts of queries that you can make. Um, and, OR, and the library, such as the ORM, knows how to cache those queries in efficiently and how to do the right invalidations for the limited set of updates they allow. So what I want to talk about today is a new perspective on adding caching to web applications. We want to think of, we're going to think about adding caching as compiler optimization. And so today I'm going to tell you about a compiler optimization that adds caching to web applications. It's called SQL Cache, creatively named. And it's a compiler optimization for the Urweb programming language. I'm going to tell you more about Urweb in a bit. So Urweb is a domain-specific language uh, for web applications. And uh, C cache is just another phase of the com or a compiler happens shortly before code generation. And SQL cache handles these four problems of adding caching to website automatically. Now, right now, SQL cache is sound for single server applications. So I'm going to tell you a bit about how SQL cache uh, accomplishes these four things today. So I'm going to I'm going to. We're going to work with a running example of an Urweb program for managing a website about drawings, cute little drawings like these. Each drawing has a shape, like square or pentagon, and a filling, like a scribble or spiral. Oh, you don't have to read all this code. I'm not going to talk that much about Urweb, about Urweb itself today. We're going to focus on the queries. Um, but uh, a few things you should know about Urweb. It's basically ML with certain uh, domain-specific elements injected uh, injected uh, for working with web applications. Uh, so each of these top-level functions is a web page. So this is a really exciting website for drawings, three different web pages. Uh, 
It has a web page, Shapes of Fill, that uh, lists all of the shapes in, your, in the database of, draw, of drawings with a particular filling. It has Add Drawing, where when you visit this web page, it adds a drawing to the database. And when you visit Replace Fill, it finds all of the drawings with a certain fill and replaces them and refills them with a different one. So when SQL Cache is given this Urweb program, it identifies the Shapes of Fill web page as a good region to cache. That's basically because it's read-only. It consists of a SQL query, but no side effect, no updates or anything. So th this cached region depends on two things. First, it depends on the database state because of the query. It also depends on a free variable of the expression, uh, x. So x becomes the cache key of this cached region. So SQL cache also needs to add invalidations to this cache when the database state changes. So there are two update statements that SQL Cache is going to analyze um, against, the against the query in the cached region to figure out what invalidations it's going to need to make. Those invalidations are going to be, can be in terms of the free variables of, of, the, of the SQL updates. So in this case, Y and Z are web variables that appear in the update. So those might be used in, as part of the invalidations. So let's start by, uh, by looking at uh, how, how we handle invalidations for an insert statement. So here's the, an abbreviated version of a query from the shapes of fill web page. Select shape where fill equals x. And an abbreviated uh, version of the insert statement from the add shape, from the add drawing web page. Insert shape fill equals yz. Uh, so we can imagine that we might, uh, we might first visit the uh, shapes of fill web page, and, uh, which will fill cache with a few entries. So we might visit with x equals spiral. Uh, that'll perform a query that selects these two shapes, which will fill the cache with that data. We might then visit ag again, select all, all shapes where x equals scribble, and fill the cache with these two scrolls. Now let's suppose we insert a scribble pentagon into the database. We ask, what cache entries need to be invalidated? Well, here the scribble pentagon would have been selected by the blue query. So, base, so the result of the blue query has changed. So the, so, the, so the cache entry for the blue query is old, so we have to invalidate it. So this is a pretty simple example, pretty easy to kind of do in your head intuitively. But the question is, how can we come up with this invalidation policy automatically? We, we want to write a program that kind of does automatically for every query update pair in the program. So the way we do this is we come up with an invalidation formula. So the validation for, so whenever in, in sorry, Whenever an invalidation needs to happen, this invalidation formula is going to be true. So, so, basically, when, so basically, as long if this invalidation formula is true, uh, we, and we do an invalidation, we're going to be doing invalidations whenever we need to. So here's how this invalidation formula works. We, we basically existentially quantify over row, which is basically the row which is the fa whose fault it is that we need to invalidate. So there's, if we need to invalidate, there's some row, shape fill, and it's that row's fault we're doing this invalidation. Uh, so we ask, under what conditions is it a row's fault that we need to invalidate? Well, there are two things that need to be true. First, that row needs to be something that's selected by the query. So if it's this row's fault we're invalidating, it's because it's a row that's selected by the query. Second, it needs to be a row that is actually inserted by the insert statement. If it's this row's fault that we're invalidating, it's because it's a row that just added to the database. So in this kind of generic way, uh, we can come up with this invalidation formula for any query pair, insert, for any query insert pair. Now this invalidation formula by itself isn't very useful. So what we do is we come up with a simplification of the invalidation formula. Basically, if the invalidation formula is true, this simplification will also be true. And this simplification has no quantification or anything. It's just, it's going to be a conjunction of equalities between cache keys and values that are known during the update, such as free variables of the update. So what's important about this sort of equality is that we can read off this equality as a program telling us how to invalidate the cache. So remember that the cache key is x. So if whenever an invalidation happens, it's necessarily the case that x equals z then it is sound to, to use the invalidation policy. Whenever you do this insert, invalidate the cache at QZ. So we can tell the same story for updates. Uh, it's a bit more complicated, so I'm not going to go over it today. 
Um, but we come up with another sort of another invalidation formula. It's a bit bigger. Uh, again, we, uh, we uh, I guess one thing that's important for this example is that we have a disjunction of two such equalities, which means that we have two, two invalidations. Uh, this makes sense for updates because we are changing one row into another row. So we have to worry about both what the old row was and what the new row is. And even this ver simplified version is still slightly less complicated than the, than the one that you can read about in the paper. Okay, so uh, one more sort of uh, query I want to talk about. So none of the, the query example we've seen so far had a single injected variable. Uh, we can, we may also have query expressions that have multiple variables injected, uh, multiple free variables. So when, when a cached region has such a query, uh, the, ca the cache needs a compound argument, a compound key. So we have a pair x, which is the cache key for, uh, for this query. And so let's talk, uh, I'm gonna, let's talk briefly about what sorts of invalidations we get for this query against the, against the insert and update. So the insert, um, we can write the invalidation formula, find a simpler version, and that simpler version ends up being x equals z and y, and w equals y. Basically, uh, we have, basically we get a single invalidation. For, uh, when we do the same process for the update, uh, we get, it turns out the same invalidation formula as before, x equals y or x equals z. So this formula says neither of the disjuncts say anything about the value of w. What that means is that when we're doing the cache invalidation, we're saying all, we, we need to invalidate all of the entries where x equals y, but we haven't made any restriction on w. So we have to invalidate all, all of these entries for all values of w, where x equals y, similarly for z. So in order to support the sort of compound invalidation, uh, we need a specific type of data structure. So we use a, a tri-like data structure, which has multiple levels. It has a root node, and then one level for kind of each part of the cache key. So when we, so when, when we run this update, uh, say, say we need to, we run it with y equals squiggle, z equals scribble, sorry, spiral and scribble. <laughs> um, uh, so there are no spirals in this cache, but we need to invalidate uh, basically z star, so the entire subtree where z equals scroll. So we need to do all these invalidations. Now it takes, a, we can't walk over all of these entries, so we have a scheme by which we can touch a single node basically each time we need to do such a mass invalidation. We do this by adding timestamps to each node in our cache. So there are two types of timestamps. There are purple timestamps, query timestamps, uh, these mark uh, basically what these these live at the leaves, which are the actual cache entries, which mark when this cache entry is filled. So this query happened at two o'clock. Um, now we also have invalidation timestamps that mark the, these mark when this node was last invalidated. So when we need to do this mass invalidation Z star, so we do it at four o'clock. We're going to change the invalidation timestamp of the node at the root of that subtree to four o'clock. Now when we do a query, uh, say, say we ask for this query against the scribble pentagon, we're gonna check its query timestamp against the invalidation timestamps of all of its ancestors. And we're gonna find that there is an invalidation timestamp newer than its query timestamp, so we're gonna treat it as invalid. However, if we then do a later query, basically refilling the cache with, uh, with updated data, if we then Next time we query this cache, we're going to see uh, a newer query timestamp than any of the ancestors' invalidation timestamps. So we treat that entry as valid. So uh, basically, using this scheme, uh, we can support all of the, these mass invalidations as and all of the query operations we need in time that is constant in the cache size. Obviously, it grows with the number of, of kind of parts of the cache key, but that's typically small in practice. So I've talked a little bit about the we do SQL analysis and our cache data structure. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on how we do the other two things. So for program instrumentation, um, basically SQL cache looks for kind of big blocks of read-only code to cache. It tries to consolidate caches without kind of being too many cache, without kind of having too many cache keys at the same time. Um, well, we, uh, one important thing that SQL cache does is it's often able to cache not just the database results, 
but kind of computation that's based on those database results, so in, um, including for some of the benchmarks uh, that I'll show you in a bit, um, SQL Cache actually caches entire web pages and can just spit that out on a cache hit. Uh, for, concur for concurrency control, right now we have a kind of two lock scheme that you can read more about in the paper. Uh, one thing about our concurrency control right now uh, is that one thing about our concurrency control right now is that it has a lot of serialization uh, during updates. So caches that have a lot of updating but not that many cache hits end up basically slowing the program down more than they speed it up. So we also have a little bit of run to monitoring to detect that and basically deactivate caches that are not pulling their weight. So we evaluated SQL Cache by uh, testing some real or web applications, uh, by testing their throughput compiled with and without SQL Cache. So without SQL Cache, this, this is just base or web, um, no, no caching. And web with SQL Cache, same exact source code, caching added automatically and validation added automatically. Um, and we basically observe that we get more or less a double the throughput uh, for exactly the same code. Uh, so it's, uh, this is a graph for one of the applications we benchmarked called Course, uh, which is course management, course management web application. Uh, we, we tested both uh, just the impact of number of server, the number of threads on the server. Uh, we also tested the impact of making se several writes per second. Uh, and uh, we, ob we observe that SQL Cache's performance maintained is still pretty good, even in the face of many writes per second. 100 writes per second is a lot for uh, most web applications. And so yeah, that's it. You can try SQL Cache today. Uh, it's in mer merged into the current web distribution. Um, and yeah, so uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. So, so I actually have one question, Steve. Yeah. Uh, you, I think, presented this as a system which has a, a single web server running on top of a database. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I might want to configure the system to have multiple web servers. So how, how do you deal with that kind of situation? Right. Uh, or how would you deal with it? Right, good question. So, um, so there are there are a couple of things, a couple of extra problems you run into. Um, so, uh, this is basically the distributed systems problem, which is how you di how do you distribute a system. Um, uh, so basically, you need to have some sort of communication between different web servers. We haven't really thought too much about that. Uh, one approach that might work is uh, distributing the cache. So uh, systems like memcached are basically big distributed hash tables that distribute a single hash table over many web servers. So um, kind of one pos approach that might just work um, more or less by itself is plugging in memcached as a giant hash table kind of as the back end for that tri day distributor we saw earlier. Um, however, memcached might not have the right concurrency guarantees that we right now still manage with SQL Cache. Have you, uh, have you considered uh, using your cache optimistically and then doing need validation? So, so it's at, at transaction mid time, basically? Right, but we've considered it, but we haven't, haven't implemented it yet. Okay. Other questions? Raise your hand if you want the microphone. So you mentioned that um, SQL cache automatically instruments the code. Um, is there a possible interface for the user to suggest instrumentations? Like if they're possible, is, as a user, can I suggest which regions I want cached or anything like that? Good question. Uh, right now, uh, we have no such interface. Uh, basically, deciding exactly which regions are the best regions to cache is an area ripe for future search. Uh, 